Hello and welcome to a special interview for Talk Wildlife and an interview that I would much rather have been doing outdoors, especially because the place in question is only about 10 miles away from my house. And that is a project that is joint between uh, Bishop's House in Norwich and also the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And it's a project called Bishop's House Garden Wildlife Audit. I'm delighted to have with me Sam Garland, who's the head gardener of the garden. Hiya, Sam, how are you? Good morning. I'm fine, thank you. Hi. Thank you Good. for having me. <laughs> the best thing to do, Sam, is just to start off by, before we actually start talking about this project, is just to put into context. The garden itself, so, I mean, I've been there, it's a fantastic garden and you're doing a brilliant job. Um, but whereabouts is it in Norwich for a start? So it's right in the centre of Norwich. Um, it's actually just to one side of the cathedral. Um, and it is uh, a really old garden. It's been here for just over 900 years. It's been gardened for over 900 years. Um, so it's full of history. Um, and actually it's, it's slightly hidden away. So a lot of people who live in Norwich don't necessarily know that it's here. It's behind a large precinct wall um, and, and it's quite secluded. How long have you been the gardener there now? Uh, I've been the gardener here for uh, just over a year and a half now. Right, and, and so not that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not that long. And and what drove you to arrive at the decision to make it more wildlife friendly? Because I know, because obviously I've, I've met you and I'm working on uh, some of the audits. But what drove the decision to go right? No, I want to. I want to take this, which is already a fantastic garden, and I want to make it a lot more wildlife friendly. What drove that decision? I think we're at this critical kind of juncture, aren't we, as humans? Um, we're destroying the natural world at a rate that's so fast we can barely, the science can barely keep up with it. Um, and I think everyone needs to try and do their part. And I think in horticulture, um, gardeners over the years haven't been so, so good, especially in professional gardens, professional um, horticulture hasn't been so good at, at keeping pace with trying to be sustainable and environmentally friendly. And so I think, um, you know, it's very popular now and lots of other people are, are trying to do the same thing, really. But, um, but I feel like every, every garden and every gardener should be making that their, their main focus, really, to try and preserve wildlife and increase biodiversity and just try and help the planet out a bit in general. Right, okay, well, you know, highly commendable uh, reasoning anyway. Um, so just in a nutshell and, and quickly on that before we move on to the project, um, you mentioned about, uh, you know, professional gardeners and, and potentially amateur gardeners and just general gardeners that are, um, they're not familiar with what needs to be done in order to make a garden wildlife friendly. So what, what are the key things? What, what, what have you changed in the way you're gardening or in the way it was gardened for many years? What have you changed yeah. so far? I, I, oh, there's loads of things we've changed so far. I'll give you a few examples. Um, one of the probably the absolute key thing I would say is to um, to stop chemical use as far as possible. Um, to allow invertebrates and soil microorganisms and fungi to thrive, and that's kind of the base of a lot of the food web uh, in the UK. So that's that's really important. Chemical use and and historically, I would say professional gardens haven't been so good with that. Still a lot of large organizations use chemicals um, like they're not a problem and there isn't a problem with them. Um, whereas we, we stopped doing that straight away as soon as I started. Uh, we went um, totally organic. So that's, that's something we've done. Um, habitat creation uh, and getting as much possible habitat in there uh, is, is definitely one of the key things that you can do to improve wildlife. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean, for example, planting just native plants. It can be having a real range of, 
of planting from all across the world, provided it's not invasive and it's going to survive okay and, and, and do all right in our climate. Um, and that, the main reason I would say that's good is because it, it supports invertebrate life. And again, invertebrate life is, is, is really important for, um, for bringing in things like birds and amphibians uh, into the garden. Um, and probably, um, yeah, probably the last, the last thing we've done is, uh, so far anyway, is, is changing our machinery use. Um, so the traditionally horticultural machinery has been uh, two-stroke petrol powered, diesel powered, and it makes a lot of noise. And one of the things that people don't think about that often when they, when they think about wildlife gardening is how much noise you can create and how disturbing that noise is to wildlife. Um, so we're trying to go electric as fast as we can. It's expensive, <laughs> so it's taking us a bit of time. Uh, it might take us a few years to be able to, to go totally electric, um, but, it's, but it's, it, it's, it's important, I think, to do that, to try and bring down the amount of noise that you make in the garden. Um, we're doing loads of other things. Uh, soil health is one of the, the things that we're really big on in the garden. So uh, trying to improve soil microorganisms and, and uh, fungi and actinomycetes and, and all those little helpful bits that improve fertility. Yeah, that, that's one um, particular area that I really want to concentrate on as we go forward. So just so people are aware, what, what's going to happen is this is a 12 month project. Um, started in sort of January, February, obviously, you know, a little bit restricted. Um, but we'll run for the year. There will be a bio blitz in September to invite the public to come along and see the gardens and some of the wildlife. Um, but, you know, what I want to do as, as the garden develops, I want to talk to you in more detail and hopefully in the garden. And one of the areas is soil. And, you know, I'm not going to go into it now because I could talk about soil for hours. But yeah, um, you, we will do. <laughs> and people will think, how can they talk about soil for hours? <laughs> Until you find out how important and how interesting soil is and mm. you know some of the the fungi plant relationships that that brings you know soil brings with it absolutely so yeah. yeah the project itself so what made you approach Norfolk Wildlife Trust how, how did that come about uh so I since I started here I wanted to do an audit a sort of baseline survey of, of what we have in the garden in terms of wildlife and and biodiversity uh, and the reason for that is that in order to make informed decisions about changes to our techniques and our management practices um, and in order for it to be targeted we kind of need to know what we've got here already uh, there's no point in i don't think there's much point in trying to to make loads and loads of changes if we don't have um you know certain species here or if they're not going to move in because of the fact that we're in the center of the city for example uh, and similarly, if we've got really high populations of something else, for example, like newts, maybe, um, we, could, we could do more to help them in the garden. And so I think it's, it's trying to understand how we kind of go forward, what our starting point is and how we move forward based on that um, to try and really enhance the biodiversity here. I think that's the, that's the key thing. That's what I wanted to do. Right. And also it's interesting, it's fascinating, isn't it, to see what is in a garden, <laughs> especially oh. right in the centre of a big city. I think that's, that's, that should be really amazing to see. It is. And as we go forward with yourself and Norfolk Wildlife Trust and, you know, the, the, the audits, um, we will, of course, sort of, you know, give people tips on, you know, what they can be doing and how they can be doing it and what they should expect to see and, you know, how they can make their gardens better for themselves, because there's a lot talked about mindfulness within nature and gardens have become a lot more important over the you know, last few months. Um, mm. So, you know, people going out and understanding what their garden's about and seeing it as almost like a mini nature reserve and yeah. recording the species and going, you know, because it doesn't take much to get more species in there. So it'd be great as we go forward to sort of, you know, mm. help people out in that route. I mean, gardens are this interesting um, kind of interface between humans and, and the natural world because they're not natural, they're manicured. And the very essence of horticulture is to manicure and control nature in a way, isn't it? Um, but I think that balance is tipped too far towards control and, 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 and away from nature. And so I guess the, the focus is to, to try and bring it back a bit, to try and regain some of that balance. Um, 
and gardens offer offer this yeah this bridge really between us and the natural world um, and we should we should enhance that and and uh, celebrate it I think well said I'm now joined by Gemma Walker. Gemma Walker is the Wildlife and Community Officer at the Norfolk Wildlife Trust and will shed some light on Norfolk Wildlife Trust's part in this particular project. So Gemma, first of all, Sam gave us a little bit of an insight into sort of how you got involved in the project. Um, when you were first approached, what was the, what was um, in Norfolk Wildlife Trust's mind? What would you think, all oh, right, okay, yeah, this, this is how we can get involved. So what were your initial thoughts on how you could actually help out with the gardens? Well, I felt it was really perfect timing. Um, back in the first lockdown of March 20, 2020, um, we produced a booklet about um, taking action for wildlife locally. And a lot of that featured what people could do in their gardens. And this went out to our membership. Um, but it was such a fantastic booklet. I felt I wanted to be able to promote it further. And so when Sam approached uh, to ask about surveying his gar uh, the, the Bishop's Garden, um, I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity for us to actually raise awareness of what wildlife is found in gardens and to also take elements of the booklet and encourage people to take action for wildlife in their own gardens as well. Yeah, and you know that that's critically important. I mean, you know, as Sam said, you know, it, it's it's part of uh, it's a contribution towards helping sort of ecosystems, really. You know, helping them back on their feet uh, because gardens play a massive role in that. Um, so you say that you've produced some documents; they're available on the website, presumably. Yes, um, we've um, produced a web page um, for the Bishop's House Garden Wildlife Audit. And on that web page, we have um, wildlife gardening leaflets. Um, we have this special booklet that we produced. Um, and also we're populating it with some how to's. So how to build a bird box, how to introduce water into your garden, how to um, create wildlife friendly uh, pots if you haven't got a big garden but you still want to do something, how to create wildlife friendly plant containers as well. So there's lots and lots, eventually there'll be nearly 50 of these how to's. Um, so it'll be, it's worth keeping an eye as we continue to populate the page over the year um, of the wildlife audit. That's excellent. So, and that yeah, and that's really good from an educational point of view. That's brilliant. So, but your title is community officer. So, how are you? Um, how are you going to involve the community in this project? Yeah. So again, um, it's very much um, a, a virtual way, if you like. <laughs> so, um, it's about raising awareness. So, we really want a team to raise awareness of the species that are found in the garden. So, as surveyors find different things we will look at those and sort of promote them and um, raise awareness of what they're finding to then encourage people in their gardens to go out and see what they can find and then you know for example if they're finding a song thrush and they've found an anvil so a place where the song thrush is sort of like um, breaking open snails then we'll try and encourage the community to go out and search for song thrush anvils in their own garden and then from that we can perhaps start a conversation about well you know what can you do for song thrushes where you live locally so what can you provide to perhaps encourage them in or provide food or roost sites nest sites for them as well that that's brilliant because that makes it sort of really sort of wide reaching you know and you know spreading that message and that conservation message um, and it, it's right, you're having an a open bio blitz day, is that right? Yes, um, um, 
Bishop House Garden are um, opening the garden in September for one day and um, to allow us to do a bio blitz. And then a bio blitz is basically um, where you go and record as many different species as you can in a certain amount of time. And so we're going to invite the local community uh, to come along and to help us record as many different species in that time. But also it's an opportunity for them to learn as well what we've found in the garden and also um, to have a chat and find out what Sam has done in the garden himself to try and increase the diversity of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really exciting project. I mean, obviously, I'm working with Barry on some of the audits, but I know that you've also, you're also approaching some of the local specialists because, as, you know, me and Barry have got a certain amount of knowledge, but there's people out there that have got absolute, you know, excellent knowledge on various different taxa. Um, so you're going to get other people involved as well, is that right? Yeah, I mean, the great thing about wildlife is you can never stop learning about it and nobody's, you know, can be an expert on everything. And so yourself and Barry have got a fantastic wildlife knowledge. Um, but, you know, if we can also sort of like supplement your knowledge with a few other people coming in, brilliant. So, yeah, so we've got some other people coming in to, for example, look at the plants in the garden. Now, we're not talking about the plants that have been planted by Sam and his team, but, you know, the, some of the wildflowers that snuck into the, to the flower beds, you know, I'm not going to use the word weed because they're not a weed, <laughs> but looking at some of the native plants that are in the garden. So looking at the lawns, you know, some of the lawns in um, Bishop's House Garden are actually really diverse for um, different species of plants. Also looking at the walls and the, uh, around the garden, lots of lovely different types of fern. So yeah, so if I could bring other people in, we can really get a nice feel for all the different species that are represented. But also, you know, looking at a few different bits like providing some reptile mat mats that can be laid down in different parts of the garden. So those can be laid down in March and just keeping those mats sort of like uh, um, nice and quiet and then looking under them once a week just to see if we can find maybe some of those quiet and those shy species that sometimes get overlooked. So are there grass snakes in the garden? Is there, are there slow worms? You know, uh, we know there's um, newts um, that use the pond, but you know, are there any other, are there any common lizards even in the garden? So just sort of introducing a few different bits and pieces to the garden to help us see if we can find some of the more secretive species that are in there. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a really exciting project and it's great to be a part of it. Um, but it also forms part of a special anniversary year for Norfolk Wildlife Trust, is that right? Yes, it's our 95th. I hasten to add that I haven't been there that long. <laughs> but yeah, it's our 95th anniversary. And so we're celebrating it in lots of different ways this year. And, um, you know, and this is a really nice way of celebrating our anniversary because as well, you know, one of the important things about Norfolk Wildlife Trust is that um, our volunteers are a really, really important part of making us what we are. And so by having fantastic volunteers like yourself come in and helping us to run this project, it's brilliant. But, you know, as well, it's, you know, we're celebrating our 95th year, but we want people to celebrate what's in their little mini nature reserves, their gardens that are in their back gardens, to go out and find out what they've got in their garden and to celebrate whatever it might be. It might only be a seven-spotted ladybird. We love seven-spotted ladybirds. But, you know, whatever people can find, whatever they can do to help in increase the diversity of their little reserve yeah, is a really, really important. Yeah, and I can guarantee that when people start looking at their gardens, they will always find something different. They'll always find Definitely. something that they didn't realise their garden attracted. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's it, not only is a garden a, an extremely important habitat, when you get to know your garden and you get to know what's in there, it becomes a really exciting place to actually watch nature. Yeah. And the thing with um, what I was really pleased about when Sam contacted us, he said, I would like to do a wildlife audit. I want to know what's in our garden. And so many times, you know, we perhaps, you know, we'll, we'll do something in our gardens, but 
without actually knowing if we've already got a species in that garden or, if, or is there something missing? Because it's just as important to know if there's a animal or plant missing. So, you know, do if, if you don't have grass snakes in your garden, um, then, you know, why might that be? And what can you do to bring it in? So it's great to know. So with Sam and the Bishop's House Garden, it'll be absolutely fantastic to know what species are in the garden, but just as important, it's about knowing what's not in the garden and what could potentially be done to encourage those species in as well. I'm now joined by Barry Madden. Barry Madden is a volunteer for Norfolk Wildlife Trust, amongst many other things, blogger, birder, all round nice guy. Um, and Barry and I are going to be doing some of the surveys in the garden over the next year. Uh, we'll be joined by other specialists, hopefully, to do things like spiders and bats and stuff like that. Um, but I wanted to have a quick chat with Barry just as, by means of an introduction to the garden. So, Barry, You've been there a couple of times, as I have. Um, is there anything that you've sort of seen so far, any, any wildlife that you've sort of cast your eyes over so far? I think the, the thing that struck me is that there is a real sense of micro habitats in the garden. It's very well managed generally, but it's also managed for wildlife already up to a degree. So you've got very quiet areas, you've got open lawn, you've got side facing slopes. Um, you've got some sort of old walls there, which are going to be quite good for solitary bees, potentially. A bit of woodland, flower beds, plenty of nectar, a very small pond, um, log piles, all of the, the stuff that we would normally expect a wildlife garden to contain. So I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, it's a shame we haven't been able to go there more often, I think. But um, I would expect to see the normal common garden birds, to be honest. I think it's location within the city itself um, is not going to lend itself to anything that unusual, which I think is good. So I think that makes it very accessible to people. I think what we see and hopefully what we can encourage are the kind of things that people could expect in their own gardens. Um, the same with um, butterflies. I mean, I would expect the normal common garden butterflies to, to appear in season. Um, we hope to have a little bit more input to the bees. <laughs> um, a lot of those, as you know, are very small um, and are not obvious to people, even though they may appear in their own gardens, they wouldn't necessarily want to see them or to be able to identify them. So we, we hope, I think, to open people's eyes to the fact that, that these things exist and how they can be encouraged. Um, and I think the potential there is the, the, the sort of walls area, which are quite old and um, there'll be little nooks and crannies where bees are going to nest. Um, so we're going to keep an eye on that, certainly. Um, but I, th I think we're, 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 the essence of what we're going to try and do, I think, is to inspire people to do certain things, very simple things in their own garden, which will encourage wildlife. Um, to everybody's benefit, wildlife's benefit, and if it benefits people as well, it's great to think I've done that, you know, I've, I've sort of actually created that particular habitat and things are using it. So whether it's nest boxes, whether it's bee hotels, whether it's a log pile for invertebrates, doesn't really matter, you know, dig a small pond. Um, these are the things we're going to show people and hopefully encourage them to do that very thing in their own garden. Right, and, and of course, while we're doing any auditing, we'll always be sort of under the flight path of the hunting peregrines. Peregrines, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and we've already seen sparrow hook in the garden, so that we know that we, you know, there's a food web around there because obviously we're seeing sort of predators, um, you know, sparrow hook across the garden and, and peregrine obviously hunting above the garden. So, um, yeah, I think it has, it has bad to the potential for sort of birds. Um, do you think that it's going to be restricted that because of the size of the wall, because obviously it's a, it's a very old established wall garden, mm. do you think that is going to have any restrictions on some of the mammals that we might get there? Because 
it is, and, and not flying mammals like bats, but if you think of where the wall is and where the river is and, you know, the yeah. outside world, do you think that might have some restrictions on mammals that we're going to record? Yeah, probably. I, th I mean, it essentially, it's an enclosed space. Um, the walls are far too high for mammals to negotiate. Um, although I would expect to see foxes, hedgehogs, and quite possibly voles will be in the garden, wood mice, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things we hope to be able to do um, as spring comes along is actually place some little humane traps um, around the garden just to sort of monitor the, the population levels of mammals, or maybe even get some sort of um, cameras set up, you know, which can be triggered when something moves in front of them. So we can record um, visually the, the wildlife we see. And of course, all of that, of course, will be put on the website so people can see it for themselves. Um, but I wouldn't expect anything too unusual, to be honest with you. Might possibly get among jack deer. We never know. We'll see. You know, I'm sure we're going to be surprised actually, by some things we do find. Um, then bats, as you say, um, that, that would be very interesting because of its location in the middle of a city. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many species we can find. I mean, the, the bats will inevitably be there. Um, I mean, you know, you and I, we did a survey at Ramworth and we're quite blown away that we had so many species um, using that particular site. Um, you know, you wouldn't normally expect that number of species to be there. So maybe we get more than the usual pipistrels. That's the intriguing nature of the project. <laughs>